you for taking the time to join us for today's webinar. Uh, my name is Scott Dill, and I'm on the business development team here at Real Story Group. Our company founder, Tony Byrne, will be on the line momentarily to walk us through the heart of the presentation, which will really highlight uh, six key trends to expect uh, in the web content management technology world. Uh, for those of you that are on the line and are subscribers, I would encourage you to also take a look at the a webinar we're hosting at uh, 1 p.m. today, which will actually be more of a myth-busting presentation that kind of talks through uh, six things that the vendors won't tell you about your uh, web content management technology vendor. So certainly hope uh, you can join us for that as well if you're a, a Real Story Group subscriber. If you're new to Real Story Group, welcome. Happy to have you here. Um, our fundamental purpose as a company is to really help organizations like yours make smart technology choices. And we do that uh, in a few different ways. First is to provide detailed critiques of over 150 digital technology products, and 34 of those are in the web content management space. We also offer interactive applications for our subscribers where they can uh, log into their account, build a customized short list, short list that's based on their uh, unique criteria. Um, they can also compare the vendors side by side. And if you don't happen to be in technology selection mode, we also have a benchmarking application called RealScore where you can measure the effectiveness uh, of your people, your processes, and your systems, and then see how you're stacking up against your industry peers and then across all verticals. And then we can provide some guidance for you uh, on a game plan moving forward along with the uh, most up-to-date chapter of your incumbent vendor. And finally, we do a select number of consulting projects throughout the year where we'll actually come on site and act as an extension of your team to help with your uh, technology roadmap planning, along with in your vendor selection process, helping to create RFI, RFP, uh, et cetera. So, you know, what's different about Real Story Group versus other industry analyst firms? Well. First and foremost, we're not cheerleaders for the vendors that we cover, okay? We really cut through uh, their marketing hype to tell you where they're strong, but you know, perhaps more importantly, uh, where they're weak and where they could fall short for you. you know, we're not concerned with telling you, okay, here's the best vendor, here's the worst vendor, but rather, what's gonna be the right fit uh, for your particular needs? Also, our only focus is on uh, digital workplace and, and digital marketing technology. And since we live exclusively in that world, we're able to provide more choices for our subscribers. And that includes some key mid-market players and open source projects and vendors that really work uh, throughout the world. That's where our, our customer base is. And certainly that's where the majority uh, of your customer base likely resides as well. So uh, those are some different areas in which we can really um, differentiate ourselves versus other analyst firms that you may have come across in the past. So with that, I'm gonna hand things over to Tony and he's gonna take us through uh, today's presentation. Tony? Great, uh, thanks everyone. It's really great to be here with you today. Um, exciting topic, something near and dear to my heart um, as the founder of the company, formerly CMS Watch back in 2001. Been following this space for about 20 years now and it never fails to surprise, but um, just a, a quick housekeeping note. Um, first, if you have any questions, feel free to use the questions tab in GoToMeeting. Um, you'll see that in your GoToMeeting control panel. I'm happy to answer any of those uh, either in the middle and then towards the end. We'll certainly have time. And then the other thing is that all of you will receive a copy of this deck in the next 48 hours. And those of you who are Real Story Group subscribers, you'll get access to the full recording that you can share with your colleagues. So with that, let's get into this. Let's look at six trends that we see coming. The first is going from content as a service to experience as a service. So a lot of interesting things happening here, particularly around so-called headless models. Then uh, another trend that I, it's going to carry is carrying over from 2016 is the growing complexity of these tools um, and what that means for you. A third trend is what I'm calling ecosystem overall. Ecosystems around these tools have always been important. I think they're going to be increasingly important in 2017 going forward. The other theme that we're seeing is WCM vendors trying to serve as also sort of like your marketing layer, and you've got to think about that very carefully whether you want to do that. Uh, the other trend that we think is going to be around Microsoft, that they may make some moves here um, after sort of exiting this use case with SharePoint. 
And then finally, we'll wrap up with this notion, um, kind of a little bit going round trip from where we started around experience as a service is more shareable micro experiences, increasingly important. So let's dig into this. First, the first trend, which is content as a service. Uh, most systems now can do this and do this fairly effectively. Uh, you make a REST or some other API call and it spits out some, some content, maybe even some marked up content out of your database. And so this is really useful for injecting content into other maybe transactional applications. This is kind of classic headless mode where you just have this content store of digital content and you can do adaptive mobile apps, you can send it to native mobile apps, you can send it to transactional applications, that sort of thing, and slot this content in. So that's obviously very useful and you can do sort of advanced kind of queries to be able to get that content. The, and, and so this is, is obviously table stakes. Nearly every WCM platform that we cover can do this, although there's a few interesting twists and turns to that. The challenge with this from a marketing perspective is sometimes it's a little bit limited because I'm just getting kind of the naked content out. I'm not necessarily getting intelligent content or an actual widget or an experience around it as well. And so I still lack that control over the customer experience. So what we're starting to see more is an interest in kind of generating more experience as a service. In other words, a more rendered component, potentially with its own JavaScript and CSS, um, it's actually going to be some visual element that you can drop into another environment. So this means that you're using your content management system not necessarily, it's, it's in kind of semi-headless mode because it's having to do some reasoning and send a whole package of content as opposed to just a stream of HTML. Um, it also may be having to use some intelligence that's built into the CMS. So that obviously has some impact in terms of performance and security and other things. So this is actually a pretty big leap from content as a service to as a experience as a service, but we're seeing marketing people who wanna have more control over omni-channel experiences, certainly kind of leaning in this direction. And this is pushing tools um, in a whole new direction. Um, this is definitely an area where some tools are more capable at this than others. Um, but it's certainly the future, and we're seeing a lot of interest in this in 2017. You know, as I mentioned, of course, though, there are issues here, and these are careful things to investigate both with respect to your own capabilities, but also uh, the vendor tools where they differ. And, and one is obviously there's a performance hit here because, the, again, the, the, the CMS is having to kind of reason against things rather than just spit out some content. Obviously, there are security issues here. Um, which uh, need to be addressed. And then also questions around context incompatibility. So if I'm actually sending a widget or something that's marked up with some uh, styling and JavaScript behavior, you need to make sure that that's going to work in all of the different places um, and that you don't have this kind of context clashing. The other thing that starts becoming important, whether it's content or experience of the service, is where used reports. This is an area where vendors honestly have been fairly weak. Um, and have kind of abdicated on this, which is really understanding if I make a change to this component, what are the downstream implications across all these channels? And then a similar issue, which marketers really care about, is multi-channel preview. So if this uh, widget or this component is going to be used in multiple different places and I want to make a change to it, how can I simulate the, change, you know, the downstream effects of those changes? Unfortunately, most WCM vendors sort of throw up their hands and say, this isn't my problem. We tend to disagree. There are a couple that are doing some interesting things around this, um, but this is, you know, again, some of the challenges that we're seeing surfacing among our subscribers as we move towards more of an experience as a service type world. So that's the first trend. The second trend is kind of related to that, which is a real growing complexity uh, among the tool sets across the board. So this is our look at the WCM marketplace as it stood at the end of last year, and then I'll talk about some changes that are happening this year. But you know, whenever we look at marketplace like this, we tend to look at it on a complexity spectrum. In other words, from things that are more productized and out of the box to things that are more platform-like and um, more, even sort of more toolkits. So on the far left, you have highly complex but potentially very rich tools. On the right. You see simpler products, uh, which tend to be more out of the box, cheaper, faster to deploy on, but often have some kind of a functional feeling in terms of what you can and can't do with them. And there's a whole range in between. And we have this red line here in between platforms and products because the general rule of thumb here is that 
if you're going to get something with a platform that's more platform like you better have at least one ideally two in-house developers who can work on this platform whereas the product you can sometimes get away with sort of outsourcing that or you know making most of your changes just to configuration um, as opposed to actually requiring a developer but what's interesting about what's really happening in 2017 is this line is really moving over in other words a lot of these tools are becoming much more developer centric um, and more sophisticated, offering things around personalization, which we'll talk about in a minute. And so they're really becoming more kind of lower end platforms. They may not be the, you know, the Telerix and eSpirit and WordPress and Magnolia and so forth may not be the most sophisticated platforms, um, but they are platforms. They do require developers uh, uh, the vast majority of the time, whether it's your developers, ideally you have some, or somebody else's. Um, and so this is pretty significant. And um, what this means is that I think our appetites are growing for more dynamic, more sophisticated content and experiences, more omni-channel experiences, and, and vendors are responding to this. So the whole, really, the whole marketplace is becoming higher end is another way of putting this. The other thing that we're seeing is the, the, the legacy platforms from some of the big infrastructure vendors. Those are have really been fading away and some have actually, you know, really disappearing. And, and um, certainly uh, those of you who, who have used some of those tools for web content management probably do not mourn their departure. But anyway, that was, that's the second trend, which is really the tools becoming more sophisticated, richer, but as a consequence, more developer intensive. And so the related trend is really around the third one, which is the ecosystem around these technologies are, are going to matter more. And again, that has to do with complexity and the fact that we're demanding more out of them, that these are becoming central to our digital strategies. And so, you know, you want to be not wholly dependent on the vendor. You want to be able to, you know, tap into this notion that it takes a village to raise a CMS. And so that can be software partners. Certainly the vendor is part of it in terms of their own tech support and professional services. But one of the things that we've always looked for is, you know, customer extranets, customer communities. How often can do user groups meet, uh, both either globally and at a local level? And obviously, the all-important services partner channel that you see in the in the lower right. And this has always been important. And in fact, we've always thought that this was the best measure of the potential longevity of the technology was the strength of the ecosystem around it. Um, but having said all that, I think that as we see all these shifts in 2017, you're going to be leaning more on this ecosystem as you as we transition some of these architectures, as we experiment with more sophisticated capabilities like personalization and all the things that flow out of that, like having an effective content strategy and so forth. We're, we're seeing our subscribers certainly leaning more on the ecosystem, um, you know, sometimes in independent consultants, uh, integration firms, um, participating more heavily in customer communities, um, looking for things like package connectors to other solutions rather than writing them themselves. And these are the sorts of things that an ecosystem is supposed to generate for you. Um, and it's interesting because, you know, this is one of the key areas in some of our own tooling. So I'm showing you a screen here from our real quadrant shortlist generator. So this generates a a, a, a vendor quadrant. And, you, you know, you pick some scenarios here, and I just picked three scenarios for WCM. But I'd would, would point your attention over here um, where you can weigh the importance of these different strategic considerations on the right. And by default, there's 10 of them, so we give them all 10%. But what's interesting about this is, you know, we're starting to, to tell people, you know, that certain things around community strength is really, is really important, and you may want to be kind of overweighting a little bit more there. Um, certainly value for money, maybe channel professional services, a um, little bit less interested maybe in the roadmap. Many of those are mythical. Certainly technical modernity is important. Um, vendor viability, again, if the community is strong, maybe that matters a little bit less. So, um, and, you know, maybe in terms of, again, the overall kind of vendor strategy also potentially something. So, you know, you can play with this yourself on our site. If you go to our tools and you can see this, but really weighting um, things like, like community strength um, uh, uh, is something that we're really encouraging people to do, even for, you know, SaaS-based type solutions. So, uh, you know, uh, a, a lot of, um, uh, uh, you know, possibilities there for you, obviously, 
Um, I see I actually overshot the landing zone here. So let's say that we're going to say technical modernity. I'm going to put up to 20%. And that gets us to uh, 100 here. And then we'll go ahead and what this does is generate the actual, you know, short list, which is always interesting to see. Now, I'm not logged in here, so it's going to just show kind of a dummy short list for us here. Um, but if I were logged in, it would actually show all of the uh, different vendors and, and everything else. Um, and so, uh, but the point, the larger point here is that this is a trend that the ecosystem is becoming more important, but it's also, I'm going to say, it's something that, that we would really advocate for you as well, which is that you should be spending, um, you know, paying more attention. So this is both kind of a, a prediction and also some uh, uh, some I I advice here as well. So you can see this quadrant came up and it shows uh, the strategic consideration. That's what we were just messing around with. And then the scenario fit, those were the, against the three scenarios that I did. And of course, I was logged in the actual vendor name should here. But you can see that from a strategic consideration, you know, they're all over the map um, in terms of what might might work and not work. And, and I think a lot of that has to do with how strong is the community around that particular product. Okay, so that's ecosystem. I think the fourth trend is another area where we would offer some advice. And so this trend is really around web content and experience management vendors, not just wanting to manage the content and experience layer for you, but also to try to manage sort of the data layer for you. And, um, you know, they, they wanting to be essentially your central marketing dashboard. And to do that, they want to then become essentially the aggregator of all your marketing data, including stuff coming out of a lot of different systems like ad serving, CRM, social media. And the argument that we have made and will continue to make is that web content experience management vendors are singularly uh, incapable of doing this effectively, that you don't really want to use them for your marketing data warehouse, that in fact, they really shouldn't be anything but a consumer of your data layer. Um, so obviously data is really important about your customers, about prospects, even uh, about anonymous visitors, that sort of thing. It's important for the overall experience. You want the web content management capability to be able to um, tap into your CRM and your marketing automation systems. But this idea that, um, that somehow they can successfully be your marketing data warehouse, we really actually haven't seen that work really effectively in the wild and you really want to be looking elsewhere uh, for that level. Now, having said that, you know, this is going to demo really well. So those of you who are architects may need to kind of push back a little bit against your marketing people because what they'll do is they'll say, well, look, if we own the whole data layer for you and we aggregate all the stuff, we can give you these aggregate reports like, you know, um, uh, uh, how many people you know, full cycle actually clicked on something to subscribe and then we send them the message and they came back. And since we're the your marketing data warehouse, we're able to give you these sorts of reports. The reality is the reports are actually fairly thin um, compared to, you know, real data warehouse um, and your ability to actually manipulate the data becomes fairly limited. So, um, you know, the, the allure of it is certainly there, but I think for any organization that's bigger than, particularly if you're a larger enterprise, you really want to separate concerns and you definitely want to separate the data layer from the web content management layer. But we're going to see more and more vendors really kind of pushing here for the simple reason that it's demo candy, right? This stuff demos really well. Um, and it's not until you actually go into production and you start actually trying to do this that you realize that you've been blending too many concerns. So once again, um, I'll invite you, if you have any questions, feel free to use the questions tab in the GoToMeeting panel, and we'll certainly have some time to address them here in the next 10 minutes or so. So once again, you know, this is this notion of, you know, the digital marketing reference model that some of you have seen before. We spent a lot of time customizing this for our subscribers, but the point here is that you have major channels, um, and then you have different delivery services here in the gray, the channels are at the top. Then you have this content and engagement management layer um, which includes WCM in green and, of course, key capabilities around asset management, marketing automation, social engagement. And ideally what you do is you have a separate enterprise data backbone that 
uh, is able to draw, you know, customer records, get get reporting data back, and 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 tap into some of your legacy data systems, maybe your ERP system, in a way that doesn't trap that data in one of these silos. That's the worst thing you can happen to is that the data gets trapped in one of these colored silos here, and therefore it doesn't become available to the others. Trend is around Microsoft. Really interesting. We think that they're going to do something this year. Exactly what it is, don't know. We don't claim to have any insider scoop. But if you've been following this space, you know that for 10 years, Microsoft said you could use SharePoint and, for that matter, the early versions of Office 365 as a web content management platform, including an externally facing web content management platform. Microsoft finally gave up the ghost on this really in 2016 by really not making any improvements to the WCM capabilities and more or less saying, look, don't use this for external, which is something we've been saying for 10 years. Finally, they kind of uh, 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 came to the, to the mountain on that. Um, they also uh, sunset the external facing web content management capabilities in Office 365, told people not to use it anymore for external facing websites. And so I think a lot of people thought that Microsoft sort of getting out of this game. But if you look at what's interesting is what's happening more around Dynamics and how Dynamics has really spread its wings from just being a CRM to more of a little bit more of a marketing resource management system, a little bit more marketing automation system. They're changing a number of things right now. So it's a very fluid environment. This is causing some distress among some Dynamics customers. For example, they sunset their existing campaign capabilities. Um, and they're going to be rebuilding those supposedly in Q3, Q4. So like a lot of things with Microsoft in the cloud, there's a lot of shifting going on, some of it very abrupt. One of the shifts that we may see is around web content and experience management. They're already providing some asset management, not global asset management you would, like you would get from a proper dam, but asset management in the context of, of delivering these outbound campaigns and, and some landing pages and so forth. And I would expect that um, that, that the natural evolution of WCM, if it happens at Microsoft, is likely going to be under the dynamic, under the Dynamics brand. Great. So the last thing here is really around supporting shareable micro experiences. I think that this is really uh, what a, a, a lot of marketers are looking at as the future. What's interesting is that a number of these small SaaS-based content marketing platforms sort of grew up around this use case, Rebel Mouse being one of them. There's dozens of others. And uh, the, the idea here is I'm not necessarily building a whole website or necessarily a whole page. I just want this, essentially this widget that can be shareable across multiple different channels, including potentially my website. WCM vendors are really slow to adapt to this and that's why we sometimes see third parties doing this. Our advice on this is to avoid going to a third party if you can because it's just one more content publishing system in your architecture which can get messy but to the extent that you can uh, push uh, to get the right WCM technology that's capable of doing this that that's ideal for you right. So your WCM technology becomes less around delivering entire properties although it can do that and more around supporting uh, shareable micro experiences that can go across different properties. So I'll just show you a couple of handy links here and then we're getting some good questions coming in, we'll address those. So if you'd like to see the RealScore uh, benchmarking service, you can find it under our tools or Real Quadrant, which I showed you a quick demo of. If you want to read any uh, excerpts of our research uh, or this a vendor map that we've been publishing for for more than 10 years now you can uh, go see that all available to sample for free on our site um, and while I'm looking at the questions here um, Scott you can maybe just do a quick minute or two about next steps absolutely thanks Tony and um, to take it one step further on the um, taking a look at the real quadrant and real score applications um, our managing director Jared Jingers actually hosted a webinar yesterday that you can now find on our website that uh, did a little behind the scenes tour of the Real Story Group subscriber experience um, so you can see those applications in action and certainly if you'd like a more uh, personalized demonstration we're happy to 
uh, to show you that, feel free to uh, email us at explore at realstorygroup.com. And um, we're always available on our uh, on our website with our little uh, chat window that you'll find in the bottom right corner. Um, in terms of next steps, uh, we have uh, another webinar next week. We'll take um, a more sort of internally facing uh, technology approach where we'll be walking through ECM marketplace trends. So looking at enterprise content management, that'll be next Tuesday, uh, April 11th at uh, 12 Eastern. And then for our uh, subscribers, again, we have a uh, Mythbuster webinar here at starting at about a half hour with Tony, uh, six things that vendors won't tell you about web content management technology and uh, similar presentation uh, next week about ECM technology. So um, if you're not a subscriber, please let us know um, about that. And you can, again, reach us at explore at realstorygroup.com or give us a call on the numbers listed. Tony, it does look like there's a few questions and I'll let you take yeah. those away. Yeah, so about next week's webinars, that's on ECM or enterprise content management. And of course, we make a distinction between that and web content and experience management. They, you know, methodologically, they overlap a little bit. But ECM is really about big time document management, imaging, records management, and related sort of compliance technologies. So uh, a very uh, a complex topic, complex marketplace, but my colleague Apoor will break it all down for you. So some good questions coming in. Amit is asking, isn't shareable micro experience